Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. I remember this as this if it were yesterday. I was, I was speaking to a, a group of middle school students, about 300 uh, fifth, sixth, seventh grade kids, and um, I wanted to get them excited about the church. But I think you can appreciate uh, there's a little bit of a challenge. You're talking to uh, middle school students about the church. Uh, it, it's like saying, you know, who wants to see a movie about broccoli? I mean, it, it just doesn't generate a ton of energy. And, uh, and so what I decided to do was I, I, I'm going to get a bunch of kids up on stage. and We're going to build a human pyramid. Now, you probably know how this works. Uh, we have five of the kind of bigger kids in the room. They, they came up, get on all fours, and they're kind of our, our base. And then we put four kids who are not quite as big on top of them, three on top of them, two on top of them. And then we had this one little uh, pixie uh, sixth grade girl who probably weighed about as much as my left leg. Um, we put her up on the very top and, and, and it was amazing. I mean, we all just kind of, we all just kind of stood there and, and watched these people, uh, you know, it, because here it was basically five stories high uh, and yet literally 15 different stories. And together uh, they had built something that none of them alone could build. And it was amazing. We were all just kind of marveling at the thing um, and, until uh, one of the kids on the bottom uh, gave out and then the whole thing kind of collapsed. Uh, but it was fun. And, 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 and most of the lawsuits have now been settled. But, but, uh, but it was interesting because it, it, it's, it's, I think what I want us to think about this morning is, is what we witnessed that day on that stage at that middle school event was a vivid example of what God calls us to be in the church. You see, here they were, all these people with different backgrounds, different uh, ethnic groups, different ages, different races. You had blacks and whites. We had some Asians at this thing and, 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 and from different places. But all of them together were able to knit their, themselves together so that they shared together and accomplished this common goal. And, and it was especially powerful because if you were even close enough, um, everybody in the room couldn't hear this, but if you were up front, you could actually hear the kids talking to each other. And so, you know, here are these kids that don't know each other, the different ages and stuff, but, but they're sharing real needs like, you know, my neck and, you know, uh, you know, could you move your knee and my back? And, 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 and they were listening. They cared because they realized that if, if, if one of us hurts very shortly, all of us will begin to hurt. And, uh, and, and so they recognized that, uh, that they were together as one. And this, I think, was a, a, a wonderful example for us of what it means to be the church. It was a glimpse, a, a beautiful, vivid, living picture of the church. Because the church is a group of people who come together to build together something that none of us alone can build, and we do it to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. That's the church. The church is a group of people, diverse, who come together to build something together that none of us alone can build. We do it to the glory of God through Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be the church. That's who we are here at, at Faith Bridge. And it's not easy. You can't, you can't just do this alone. Uh, in fact, um, you know, I used to write curriculum for this uh, denominational youth ministry publishing uh, house. And, and, and every now and then, you know, I'd have different learning exercises in the curriculum. And, and, and I remember one of the exercises was a human pyramid. And the editor for the publishing house wrote to me and said, uh, look, I don't know if you know this or not, but in our denomination, the average sized youth group is six people six people. So we've been getting some pushback from some of the youth leaders. When you tell them to build a pyramid, their kids are not enjoying it as much, uh, which I get that, right? And they're, they're probably not enjoying uh, the relay race either. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to get really pumped when there's only two people building a pyramid. But, but this is the way it is in the church. You can't do this thing alone. You, 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 you have to have other people. It's a group of people coming together. Uh, that, that's why 
We talked last week about this notion of eagerly, remember that word spuzantes, eagerly maintaining the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Just like with that, just like with that pyramid, building this thing called the church it requires a group of people who are willing to come together with a commitment to intention and sacrifice and cooperation. That's the vision Paul unfolds for us in this passage we began looking at last week in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Now, last week, uh, the question that we posed to this passage was, what does it mean to maintain the unity of the Spirit? What is the unity of the Spirit? This week, we're going to continue that conversation, but our focus is going to be on how. How do we maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace? So uh, if you have a Bible, let's return back to Ephesians chapter 4. You want to open it to Ephesians chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible, you see these uh, very cheerful people strolling down the aisle, uh, loaded for bear. Uh, you'll raise your hand. They'll be happy to see that you get a Bible. And uh, again, we'd, we'd love for you to have this Bible as a gift. You can take it, take it home with you. Bring it back next week and, and uh, read along with us. Ephesians chapter 4. This is going to be in the, the back portion of the Bible. I'm going to start reading it in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called the, the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And then skip with me down to verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. I don't know if you you probably don't think about this very much. I don't think most of us do. But every single movement, every single gesture uh, that we make with our bodies requires a cohesive combination of muscles. So you you know you, you can't have uh, you know your arms saying, "Dude, uh, we're going to go throw frisbee," and your hands say, "Oh, well that'll be fun. We're going to stay here and play with our fidget spinner." Uh, the, the, the entire body has to work together. There has to be some cohesion. There has to be a unity. In fact, I actually found a website a couple weeks ago um, that said it takes 17 different muscles working together just to execute a frown. 17 muscles for a frown. Uh, if you want to ride a bike, you want to ride a bike, that's 155 different muscles working together. If you want to send a text, that is 38 different muscles. 38 different, some of you middle school, high school students, nice work on the exercise. Uh, you, you might even want to get a brief workout during the sermon. Uh, that, that, uh, and, oh, and by the way, if you're wondering, uh, it takes 35 muscles to kiss. 35 muscles to kiss. If you actually kiss while you're riding a bicycle with someone, that's practically a triathlon. Uh, it, it's unbelievable, just all kinds of exercise. Uh, but for your body to accomplish what you want your body to accomplish, it takes an intentional um, effort of diverse muscles and body parts working together as, as one body. This is precisely the image that the Apostle Paul gives us in Ephesians 4 when he describes a, a healthy church. He writes, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. What we're going to see this morning is that for us as the body of Christ here at Faith Bridge and, 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 and even beyond uh, Faith Bridge in, in, in our other congregations, our other friends, members of the family in Harris and, and Montgomery counties and, and even, even beyond the borders uh, of our, our country around the world, we as the church, uh, we are called to maintain the unity of the spirit, to build together what none of us alone 
can build. And for us to do that, especially in these uh, contentious and fractious days, that's going to require us to exercise four key relational muscles. Four key relational muscles. Look with me again at the text. Look at verse 2. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Four muscles, humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another in love. Now, let's, let's take a look at each one. We'll begin with humility, humility. Paul begins right there in verse two by saying, with all, with all humility. For us to build uh, that pyramid that morning with those middle school students, it was absolutely essential that some folks were willing to be down on the bottom. We, we could not have built something that we were trying to build. We could not have built that if everybody wanted to be the person on top. That's why Paul begins this passage, this verse with these three words, with all humility, with all humility. And he adds that word all for emphasis because he understands humility is the foundation for unity. Humility is the foundation for unity in the spirit. To get a sense of what Paul's talking about here, it, it might be helpful to have a little sense of cultural context. In, in Greek culture, when they thought about the word humility, it was a term that was despised. It, it, it sort of meant this kind of servile, uh, cowering. Think of a, a beaten down uh, slave or a prisoner who, who simply no longer had the energy or even the hope to, uh, to exercise any sort of, uh, of a, a, a protest. Think of a, think of a dog that's been you know, beaten down and just kind of cowers at the hand of a brutal master. Uh, remember, uh, Toto in front of Oz, you know, just, just uh, absolute, just, just total fear. That was their notion of humility. It was certainly not something uh, to be respected, certainly not an, uh, a quality to be desired. And, and to some extent, I think, if you think about it, in Western culture, we have in some ways embraced this same uh, sort of idea. Our whole approach uh, to success in, in work is to climb up the ladder, to work our way up the ladder, to claw our way to the top. I mean, read our, read our tweets, listen to our conversations, watch our uh, Facebook posts, think about our advertising campaigns, our social media. We are a culture that champions the put down way more than we champion the put up. We, we admire people who, who have attitude. We admire that. Paul writes in Romans 12, 10, outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another in showing honor. Our national motto seems to be outdo one another, period. That's kind of where it stops for us. Jesus said in Luke chapter nine, verse 48, whoever is the least among you is the greatest. Whoever is the least among all of you, he is the greatest. And Jesus understood the bottom is no place for lightweights. Now, of course, humility has its counterfeits, as with all good things. And to understand the difference between true humility and false humility, um, it, it, I think it's worthwhile to observe that the way the King James Version renders verse 2 is instead of using the word humility, it actually uses the word lowness, lowness. Um, and, and I think that's a pretty good translation because true humility, excuse me, lowliness, true humility is lowliness. It's, it's being willing to go to the bottom. It's being willing to, to be low. That, that's, that's true humility. But false humility is rooted more in an attitude of lowness. In other words, kind of an unhealthy self-loathing uh, that, that poisons relationships and conversations and even congregations because, because it says, oh, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to offer. I, I, I don't, nobody cares what I have to say. I'm not, uh, you fill in the blank. I'm not smart enough, young enough, pretty enough, cool enough, old enough, talented enough to do that. It's interesting. Look at verse seven. Paul makes it very clear in this fourth chapter of Ephesians, that grace was given to each one of us. 
All of us, according to the measure of Christ's gift, you have something to offer. I have something to offer. All of us have something to offer to the body. In fact, in verse 11, uh, Paul kind of zooms in on this idea by, by describing us as saints, saints that, that, that properly equipped and deployed, we can actually build up the body of Christ. Now, the, the problem with false humility is, is we are unwilling to accept ourselves as saints gifted by God. We, we look in the mirror, we look at ourselves, we go, no, no, I'm, I'm a, I'm a ain't, you know, I'm a, I'm a Kate. I can't, I can't really be used by God. That's not true humility. That's pseudo humility. And for God to do through our body of believers right here at Faith Bridge, what he's called us to do, we need a spirit-inspired humility that says, I can't, I can't, but Jesus can. Jesus in me can. That's true humility. And, and maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're, you're sort of disconnected from what God's doing here. You come every Sunday, but you really aren't that involved. And in part, it's because you're haunted by this, this weight of false humility. You're, you're kind of timid about getting involved because, because there's a whole bunch of stuff you can't do. You can't sing. You're, you're too young. You're not good at handing out bulletins or parking cars or, you know, being with teenagers or, you know, hanging out with little children. And, 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 and so you just kind of step back and sort of let things happen. But of course, once you begin to realize that you can't do everything, that's actually step one towards true humility. That's what it means to appreciate the body, right? The, the, the toenail realizes it can't see. The, 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 the kneecap appreciates the fact that it, it needs a nose to smell. The elbow appreciates that, that it's not going to be very helpful to butter your biscuit. That, that there are different body parts required for different things, and all of us has a role to play. That's why we have a body. We all need to do our part. With true humility, we don't, we don't focus on all the things we can't do. We focus on that which by the Spirit's power in us, we can do. That's humility. And that's the first muscle. That's the first muscle we have to exercise to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Second muscle is meekness. Meekness. Um, Paul goes on to say in verse 2, with all humility and meekness, with all humility and meekness. Now, again, you might wonder why I would use the word meekness. Uh, where the English Standard Version, uh, many of your Bibles probably use the word gentleness. Um, I prefer the word meekness, and, 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 and here's why. Um, I, I think most of us, when we hear the word meekness, uh, I, I think we are sort of put off by this. Uh, it, it's, uh, we hear the word meekness, it, it sort of uh, reminds us of, of weakness, you know, or, or, or geekness. And, and as we think about weakness, it, it sort of has this, it sort of has this, this negative vibe vibe. I think um, most of us generally don't think of meekness as a quality we really want to cultivate. It, it's just not one of those things we aspire to. I read uh, the other day about this. Um, there's a website where you can, you can, for your friends, you can actually uh, build what's called a word cloud or some, sometimes they'll call it a, a wordle or a tag cloud where all of your friends kind of come together and they put in adjectives that describe you. And then uh, this kind of cloud of adjectives describing you is generated by this uh, website. And I, I don't know about you, but I think most of us, we think about a, a word cloud describing us. We, we probably would like people to use words like creative, you know, and fun and spontaneous and athletic and, and handsome for a bald person, uh, you know, good hygiene, uh, nice bowler. I mean, I, that kind of thing, right? The point is, I don't think very many of us hope we wouldn't be scouring the cloud looking for the word meek because we don't think that's that much something we want to cultivate. But that's in part, I think, because we don't fully appreciate the power of this notion of meekness. M meekness is kind of a fascinating word in the Greek language because the word that the Greeks use for meekness is the very same term that was used to describe a wild animal that had been brought under control. In other words, uh, meek is the animal that has the capacity, it has the power, the strength and the passion to inflict real pain and real injury, but 
because of its obedience to its master, it brings those passions under control. So, so meekness is not about weakness. It's about an inner strength in the face of anger or insult or offense. It's, it has the capacity to strike back. It has the passion to strike back, but chooses instead to exercise the self-control necessary to, to tame those passions, to, to hold the tongue, to, to not fire out that email, to, you know, to maybe think twice before posting that outrage online. That's not weakness. That's strength. Now, I, I think probably most of us here this morning uh, go, well, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of like, that's kind of me, you know. I think most of us sort of think of ourselves as people who have a relative amount of, a decent amount of self-control. Uh, we, we, we can usually kind of keep a lid on our emotions. Uh, yes, yes, okay, there are some times when the tempers flare and the words fly, uh, but, but that's not the real us. That's not the real us. And the other day when I yelled at the kids, you know, uh, the other, that, that rant on Facebook, uh, uh, the other day uh, when I gave that guy the one-way sign with the wrong finger in the intersection, that was, that, that's not the real, when I dropped out of grow group because those people are, are jerks, that, that, that's not, that is not the real, that's not the real me. The real me is a person who is reasonable, gentle, and Meek and meek. Um, what Paul's suggesting here in Ephesians chapter four is if you really want to know whether or not you are exercising this muscle of meekness in an authentic way, watch what happens in the face of unkindness. How do you respond when you're provoked? Well, what, what do you do when you find out somebody talked about you behind your back? How do you respond in anger? How do you respond to the offense? In fact, let's, we'll, just, we'll just do a little experiment. We'll see how this works. Um, this gentleman right here on the end. Would you come up here real quick? Just come on up here. There you go. Holy cow. You knew you shouldn't have come this morning. <coughs> you violated law number one. You sat on the front row. Good morning to you. Tell me your name. Noah. Noah? Fantastic, Noah. Duffy Robbins, pleasure to meet you. Uh, Noah, what I want to do is, uh, first of all, I'm not going to do anything that's going to embarrass you, I promise, okay? What I want you to do is we're going to sort of simulate, uh, I want you to pretend like I'm holding a cup of water, okay? So I'm now going to hand you my cup of water, okay? And you're going to hold it carefully, right? Because I need that water when I speak because sometimes I, my voice gets dry and... That's a bummer, right? Okay, so let's say, though, that while I'm talking here in a, in a frenzy of excitement, I gesture this way, and I bump your hand, and you spill my water, okay? Now, my children at home probably right now saying, Jesus, help Daddy have enough water. But, but you, you uh, in an act of brazen carelessness, uh, allow me careful. Uh, allow me to, to spill the water. So, so if I were to ask you, how would you answer this question? Why did water come out of that cup? Why did water come out of that cup? Because you hit my hand. Okay. See, Noah says, because I hit his hand. <laughs> it's never our fault, is it, Noah? Uh, I mean, that, that, uh, okay. Noah, you know, what I don't need is a lot of accusations. I'm a thirsty man and I'm getting angry. I'm exercising meekness even now. No, that's not why water came out of the cup. I'm going to ask you one more time. Why did water, <laughs> why did water come out of that cup, Noah? Because I wasn't holding it. Noah now pummeled into submission says, because I wasn't holding it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going, whatever. Just get me off the stage. Uh, yeah, no, I, I just, um, that's not why water came out of the cup. Now, let me, you know, I was doing this the other day and this girl goes, well, I said, don't blame it on the well. But no, no, but, uh, you, uh, you know why water came out of the cup, Noah? It's because water is what was in the cup. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can have a seat. Thank you. Yeah. Let's give Noah a round of applause. Here's what Paul's saying if you want to know whether or not you are filled with Jesus, watch what comes out when you get bumped. Because if Jesus doesn't spill out, maybe it's because we are not truly filled with Jesus. 
In other words, what he's talking to us about here, what Paul is calling us to here is a a meekness about self-control. What happens when we get bumped? In, In other words, am I willing to stay at my place in the pyramid doing my part? Even if the person below me is unstable, even if the person above me is kind of a pain in the neck, will I stay there even when I get bumped? That's not weakness. That's a Jesus-inspired, a Jesus-filled strength. That's the second muscle Paul points us to. Let, let's talk about a third muscle. Humility, meekness, and patience. Patience. Uh, Paul writes in verse 2, with all humility and gentleness, or meekness, with patience. Now, patience, I think, is a term most of us are familiar with. It, it, it sort of points us to a delayed response, a willingness to, to wait, a hesitancy to, to jump to conclusions, uh, a commitment, as James puts it in chapter 1, uh, verse 19, to be quick to hear, but slow to speak, slow to anger. I think probably a hundred years ago, if a preacher were preaching about this in Texas, he would describe it as talk first, shoot later. Uh, It's, it's, uh, I I think, uh, first of all, let me just say, I'm not going to talk about patience a lot. And and the reason I'm not is because uh, I I find this very convicting and it makes me a little uncomfortable. Uh, I, I, patience is just not my sweet spot. I, um, I mean, I literally, I'm one of those people who in the, in the supermarket after I've ready to check out, I, I literally stand there and I look at all the different lines and then I have this kind of algorithm where I calculate how many groceries are in the cart, how many people are in the line, what is the age of the shoppers, what is the competency of the cashier and I begin to calculate all that and then I take my 30 items to the express lane (laughs) and uh, try to shop where nobody knows I'm a Christian. But uh, that's just buying groceries. That's just buying groceries. The real test of patience, of course, is, is, is in our day-to-day interactions, isn't it? With, 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 with people, family members, roommates, people with whom we share a bathroom, co-workers, uh, people in call centers, people in your grow group, people uh, in the church that don't have the good sense to recognize that your position is accurate and theirs is flawed. Uh, the, the, the dictionary defines patience as slowness to avenge wrongdoing. Slowness to avenge wrongdoing. Patience is the recognition that when a body part causes pain to another body part, if the wounded body part strikes back. That's not going to cause less pain. That's going to cause more pain. That's going to cause, that, that's why the King James Version actually translate the word patience as long suffering, long suffering. Because you see, most of us are willing to put up with a lot of pain in our own bodies, right? We are long suffering when the pain is coming from our own body parts. We don't like it, because it hurts, but, but let's suppose I go to the doctor's office and, and, and I say, uh, doc, you know, I've got an ingrown toenail. He says, fine, put it up there on the table. And I put it up there and he goes, whack, and it cuts it right off, cuts my foot off. And uh, now, now, okay, you've dealt with my ingrown toenail, but, but, but that doesn't cause less pain. That's going to cause more pain. I, w- I would have been far more willing to suffer along. I would have been much more willing to be patient, long suffering with that pain than I am to settle for amputation of a body part. But here's what happens in the church. A lot of times in the church, in the body of Christ, when somebody or something kind of offends us or causes us pain, well, we immediately our default response is amputation. We just, we just basically say, well, we're going to cut those people off or, or we're going to cut them out of our lives. Or, or, or frankly, if we're typical American church growers, we're just going to cut out. We're going we're to find another church where people like that do not worship there. And, and what we need to recognize is that in this pyramid of human relationships we call the church, all of us, all of us at some point cause pain to the body. All of us do. And if we want grace and mercy extended to us, we need to extend grace and mercy to others, right? It, it's like that woman who said um, she had her portrait done and she said to the artist, I don't, I don't like that picture. That, that portrait does not do me justice. And he looked at her and said, man, with a face like yours, you don't want justice. You want mercy. Now, well, you know what? I don't know about you, but I want mercy. 
But if I want mercy, I need to extend grace and mercy. That's what it means to live in the Christian community. Jesus is inviting us in the church to come together as a community of grace and mercy. Now, no, 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 that doesn't mean that we're supposed to sort of shut down uh, honest communication and, and straightforward disagreement. That's, that's not authentic community. In fact, uh, look at verse 15. Paul says, speak the truth. Speak the truth. That's important, even in our disagreements. But it's equally important that we always speak the truth in love. In love. Because we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. That's why Paul calls us to humility, meekness, and patience, long suffering, which leads us to our fourth and final muscle, bearing with one another, bearing with one another in love bearing with one another in love. And I have to say again, I actually prefer uh, the word that King James Version uses here. Uh, it's the word forbearing with one another in love. Forbearing with one another in love. And, and the reason I like that term is it helps us to understand the difference between patience and forbearance. They're not the same thing. They're, they're, they don't mean the same thing. Patience is bearing with, forbearance is bearing for, right? Patience says, I'm not gonna get back at you Forbearance says, I'm going to show you kindness. I'm going to actually show you kindness. I remember back when our daughters were just little, little girls. Um, it was a cold winter night. Every parent has this experience where in the middle of the night, I'm awakened uh, by uh, some little voice yelling out, Mommy! And all of a sudden, I hear the sound of a little girl crying. And of course, being a devoted father, I immediately turned to my wife and said, Your children need you. And, uh, and uh, of course, she does that thing uh, where she just is acting like she is just so asleep that uh, she does such a deep sleep, she cannot be awakened. And, and so I try like a couple of minutes to sort of bring her out of her coma, uh, but it doesn't work. And so I realize, okay, dad, it's on you. And so... And so sure enough, I get out of bed and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, gingerly kind of walking across the floor. And, and you know how when you get up in the middle of the night, you don't really want your body to think it's awake, right? Like if you're going to the bathroom, you kind of like, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> We're going back. To, no, I know, I know. We're going back to sleep. You know, it, 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 and, and so I'm sort of on automatic pilot, you know, vertical sleep mode. And, and anyway, and, and the floor is cold. It's a cold Pennsylvania night. Anyway, it's dark. I'm walking across the floor of my daughter's room and I step on something. And I don't know to this day what it was. I, I, I think the next morning the word transformer was embedded in my foot backward. But all I know is immediately a stab of pain just shoots up into my left foot. And, and at this point, it's all I can do to keep from crying, mommy, I need you. And, 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 and I am just kind of, ah, ah. And I finally limp over to my daughter. And by this time, she's gone back to sleep, <laughs> which irritates me. Uh, she could have at least been bleeding, but no, she's back asleep. And so, and, and so now I go back into the bedroom, I get back in bed. And then this is when something, mar this is when something beautiful happened. It really was. I was laying there in bed, my foot throbbing with pain. And all of a sudden, this was amazing. My right foot in a gesture of amazing love goes, are you okay? My right foot went, we know how that feels. That hurts. And, and, and now, now think about this. My left foot is causing me pain. My left foot is keeping all the rest of us awake. But my right foot said, I don't care. We're not just going to not show you anger. We're going to show you kind. In fact, this was beautiful. My right hand went, yeah, we care, dude. And, 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 and so all of a sudden, one part of my body is showing forbearance to another part of my body. See, that's what forbearing means. Forbearing is when we go out of our way to show kindness even to a part of the body that is causing us pain. It's more than bearing with, it's bearing for. In Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, there's a passage that very closely parallels what Paul has written here in Ephesians 4. Paul puts it this way. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. 
And then note carefully this last sentence. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. How much? As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And that's how we do it. That's how we do it. That's how we build together here. What, what none of us alone can build. We exercise four key muscles, humility, meekness, patience, or long suffering, forbearing with one another in love so that we can eagerly maintain the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. I don't know if you heard the story uh, down this way or not. It was only a few weeks ago, actually, mid-July, July 12th. It was a Wednesday afternoon. It was a beautiful day there at Panama City Beach, Florida. People were out in the surf enjoying the ocean. Uh, Roberta Ussery was there with her family. Her two boys, eight and 11 years old, were out in the surf playing. And when she looked up to check on them, that's when she had that sense that mom's fear they will have. She doesn't see them first. She scans the horizon, looks around, watches for the waves, doesn't see them. And then way out beyond the break, she spots them. Her two boys are out there, have been carried out by a vicious riptide. And she can see them waving their hands in the air and, and screaming for help. Well, of course, she does what any mom would do. She immediately starts to make her way in the surf. She's followed by some of her family members and some other people who actually saw, they were bystanders, saw what was happening. But before long, it was pretty clear that not only were the boys in trouble, but now all of Roberta and her family members and these helpers were in trouble. They were all caught in the same rip. In fact, at this point, count the two boys, there were nine people, nine people who looked as if they all might be sucked out into the ocean. It looked as if they would all be lost. And that's when something stunning happened. People on the beach actually saw what was going on and, and, and they saw the waving and the yelling. And so these beach goers who were just total strangers, they actually started forming a human chain to reach from the shoreline out to where these stranded swimmers were. In fact, the authorities estimate there are probably around 70 to 80 people involved and in, in connected in this chain. And you know, every one of those stranded swimmers was eventually rescued that day by these strangers coming together. Pretty good story, pretty good story. But it's also a doggone good picture of what we're called to be as the church. You see, all of us here this morning, th th those joining us in the woodlands and, 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 and those of you who are, who are joining us online, all of us who are members of Christ's church, we are connected to each other. And our mission is to reach out into the community and by the power of God, through our connection, through our unity, extend the saving power, the rescue, and the love of God through Jesus Christ to a desperate world. It's not going to be easy. Is not going to be easy. It may at times be inconvenient, uh, might, might be downright uncomfortable, and, and there will probably be some risk involved. But none of us can build this thing alone. But if we build it together, we can bring glory to the living God, and people will see the Holy Spirit is really and authentically alive in this place. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. As the band comes back out this morning, I want, to, I want to pose to you a couple of questions as we move into our time of worship. And perhaps some questions to kind of help you probe your own heart and think about where you are this morning. Um, maybe as you listen to these words, as, as, as God speaks to our hearts, you're going, yeah, that's, that's a muscle I'm, I'm pretty good on. But that's a muscle, ouch, that's, that's kind of weak. That one, that one definitely needs some exercise. Lord Jesus, I need you to help me bring strength to that muscle. It's, I'm, I'm weak in that area. Um, maybe, maybe you're here this morning and you just thought, well, I just kind of walked in here. We don't come uh, together on Sunday mornings just to get more information. We come so that God can bring us transformation. And, and so in these moments right now, 
as the band plays, I want to just invite you to kind of look at your own life. But this is a God who wants to heal our hates. This is a God who wants to, to join our hands. This is a God who, who wants to begin to move us together as one connect us in this chain that can bring rescue to a hurting world. I want to invite you right now to look at your own life and say, God, where do you need to work in me? What do you need to do in me so that together in this church we can build what none of us alone can build? And as you think of these things, as you consider these questions, let's worship. Let's worship God together.